Hello and welcome to another video. In this one, we're going to be answering a question that I got on stream, which is what does atomic mean or atomicity in uh, regards to programming? Uh, so I'm going to explain what it means and why it matters. And I'm going to show you one example um, and how you can make that example atomic. All right, so let's jump into it. Okay, so the word atomic in programming, uh, at least the way that I think about it is from an outside observer, an atomic action is an action which appears to go from zero to one in an instant. Uh, that is, you know, from a from a third party, you can't notice that there's some intermediate state uh, between something completes. And I guess let me give you an example of like an atomic operation, um, and one that we're going to look at later, which is writing a file. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're writing a file and you know an outside observer can potentially notice that the file exists but is empty or like exists but some of the, the data is written that operation would not be atomic because you could potentially you could potentially observe the system at a kind of intermediate point uh but an atomic file right would go from you know file not existing to file existing with the content that i expect or you know file with previous content and file with the content that i expect uh, with no intermediate state uh, another case where atomicity comes up a lot is with uh, multiprocessing or multi-threading, where you have lots of you know threads doing work on stuff, and they need to observe a system at you know a steady state or at a, a, a particular state. And you know some of the, some of the ways that people solve these problems are with locks or other synchronization primitives, such as like mutexes, or <laughs> mutex is a lock, or um, dang, what is that called? Uh, the increment and decrement lock. <laughs> Why can I not remember what it's called? Uh, I mean, there's monitors, there's semaphores. That's what I was looking for, semaphore. Um, but yeah, I'm going to show you an example where I can observe a system that is not atomic and then show you a way to make it atomic. So um, I'm going to be dealing with file IO here. And so let's make a small sample file. And we're gonna simulate a slow operating system to kind of give you the the idea of where you know individual uh, changes happen and why that's problematic. And so we're just gonna you know open a file, and we're gonna write that file. And this is not gonna be an atomic operation. So, so let's just say that we're opening foo. We're gonna write to it, and we're gonna put the contents foo in there. And that you know. It, it may look atomic, it may look, you know, dead simple, we're just opening a file and writing to it. Uh, but you could imagine the operating system might schedule a process or, or decide to run other code at any of the points in between opening this file and writing this file. So you could imagine if we, you know, exaggerated those sort of scheduling constraints, we could say maybe this does time.sleep in here. And we'll put, you know, a half second sleep here. You could also imagine that this write uh, actually ends up being a bunch of small writes. Now in Python, it usually isn't, but you can imagine this as being, you know, f.writeF, f, uh, time.sleep, 0.5, f.write, o, etc. Time.sleep, 0.5. Now most, most, you know, <laughs> operating systems are going to batch writes, so this probably would you know, actually be a single write to the file system. But you could imagine that if you had larger data or something else, you might see this split up as a series of other writes. And, you know, you might even see a case where, uh, you know, these writes are buffered in memory and they don't serialize to disk until after this context manager exits. So maybe there's, you know, a potential place for it to, to, to sleep here. And uh, just to show you that this is not atomic, of course, you could actually, you could actually replicate this by you know, running this a million times without the sleeps and observing it at various steps. If we were to watch, uh, and I did a video on watch, so I will link that in, this, in the description, and we're just going to do cat foo. Uh, oops, there's no time unit there. So we're at our original state, which is foo, and our final state should be foo containing the contents foo with a new line. And if we were to run this now, you'll see that the file got created, so it's now empty right now. Now it has the contents foo. So there was some time in between where the file existed, but it wasn't here. You know, we went from file not existing to file existing, but 
it had no contents to file existing and it had the contents foo. So you can see that was kind of a, a non-atomic operation. Now, interestingly, the separate writes didn't show up in what I was doing here. And that's because the file IO was buffered, which was what I was talking about before. If I put f.flush in here, we can see that it, it can be in a, another intermediate state here. So if we watch again, again, it goes, and it's gonna be real quick, but it goes from not existing to having fo to having foo. So you can see not existing, fo, and then foo. So you can see there's, there's in, intermediate states there. Now, with file IO, uh, there's kind of a, a trick that I've seen a lot of places. Um, I actually use this myself in pre-commit to make this atomic. And uh, you, kind of, you kind of have two options. <laughs> with file IO, you can either introduce a file lock or you can do a file replace operation. So replaces are considered atomic in file systems. Um, so let me show you what a replace might look like. Uh, let's start by writing foo.temp. So the file that we care about is actually foo. Uh, so if we write to foo.temp, we can make this slightly more atomic. And then at the end, we can do os.replace foo.temp with foo. Now, in reality, you probably wouldn't want a hard-coded file name here. Like I would suggest using temp file and then with temp file.names temporary file and then dir equals dot as temp file, temp file. And then you know do do your actual write operations here, and then replace it at the end. Um, but for the sake of discussion, we're going to just you know, take a little bit of a shortcut here and manually name it a temp file. This way, we can actually observe the system here. And this, uh, I posit, is atomic because this you know goes from the file not existing to the file existing with the contents that we expect in a single instant from an observer. Um, so if we make you know, uh, is it? this to split vertically oops control b percent okay well we'll split <laughs> in this way if we do watch cat foo uh oh i forgot to rm foo watch dash n point one cat foo and watch dash n point one cat foo dot temp we'll be able to watch this you know operation go so we'll be able to see foo dot temp get created and written of course the operations on foo dot temp are not atomic but we are on, we only care as an observer on the operations on foo so if we run this now python 3 t dot pi you see empty file fo foo and this goes wait oh, i forgot to import os <laughs> it's like why did it not complete um uh, so let's put this back uh okay we have the os model this time okay empty fo foo and then this file went from zero like not existing to containing the contents foo immediately um and that was due to the os start replace but anyway this is one example of of atomicity atomicity comes up a lot in like database programming as well so like uh you know if you're dealing with inserting data into multiple tables you usually want all of those tables to be consistent and uh, you would often use something like a transaction to write all of those or not write all of those uh, in a single instant. And you know, if your, your database engine supports transactions, that's usually a way to uh, have atomic operations. Um, but yeah, a lot, a lot of cases <laughs> deal with atomicity. And a lot of cases where it matters, uh, for example, pre-commit uses atomicity or needs atomicity because it manages a cache on the system. And if two processes were looking at that cache at the same time and got inconsistent data, it might break one of them or it might, you know, cause two installs to to break each other or something like that. And so pre-commit uses file locks to manage its cache. Um, but anyway, hopefully this was a <laughs> kind of an introduction to atomicity and you kind of get an, a little bit of an idea about how it works and how you might observe a system that may or may not be atomic. Um, but anyway, if you have additional things you want me to explain, leave a comment below or reach out to me on the various platform. But thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next one.